This Week on Quadriga, Afghanistan after Karzai, Chaos or New Era. 12 million Afghans are eligible to vote in the country's presidential election on the 5th of April. It will be the last such poll before NATO troops leave Afghanistan by the end of the year. If it goes smoothly, it will be the first democratic transfer of power in Afghan history. President Karzai cannot stand for a third term in office. But the signs are not good. The Taliban have carried out a series of attacks in recent days and warned Afghans to stay away from the polling stations. Fears of election fraud also threaten to undermine the vote. Corruption is among the many problems that will await the new president too, along with ethnic conflict and the challenge of building Afghanistan's shattered economy. Your host this week is Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Afghans are headed to the polls to elect a new president as the Hamid Karzai reign is coming to an end. So the question is, who will follow him? Who will be the next president of Afghanistan? And perhaps more importantly, what challenges await him? That's what I want to talk about on today's show, together with three experts, all who've been following events in Afghanistan very closely. Welcome to Malais Daud, who is an associate research fellow with the Barcelona Center for International Affairs. He has worked for the Afghan government and a number of Afghan and international NGOs. Günther Knabe is the former head of Deutsche Welle's Asia program, as well as DW's former diplomatic correspondent for Asia and the Islamic world. And Sven Hansen is a senior editor for Asian affairs at the German daily newspaper Die Tageszeitung. He has traveled frequently to Afghanistan and in the past has helped train Afghan journalists. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. The elections are about to take place a few days um, from now. Malais Dao, let's talk about Hamid Karzai first and foremost. His 12-year reign is coming to an end. 12 years, that's the equivalent of three terms for a German chancellor. So a lot of time actually to do good or rather the opposite. My question would be, um, how would you evaluate his tenure as president? What do you think his legacy will be? Thank you so much. I guess uh, we need to uh, remember, as you said, that this is the second longest pres uh, head of state we've had in the past 100 years. And um, if you want to compare President Karzai to anything else, it's the past presidents or heads of states we've had. And in all honesty, he's been the most res restrained and patient uh, president we've had in a very long time. What he achieved to me, the most important thing is number one, that now we have a state. It's weak, it's ineffective in some ways, but this is a state that we had lost during the Civil War and then Taliban era. Number two, there is relative democratic uh, practices in place. Uh, at the same time, we have relative pluralism. It's not perfect, there are lots of challenges, but we are progressing and we are moving forward. Um, number three, um, I would say the level of cohesion he has created amongst the leadership of the country, both the ones who came from abroad, the so-called technocrats, and also the so-called warlords, the former warlords. Now, they're all sitting together uh, and they have almost shared the same goals and, and uh, aspirations. And these are the main achievements of President Karzai because he was the one who brought everyone in, who integrated almost everyone in power. I know there are also downsides to this, but uh, this was one of his main achievements. So a rather positive assessment then uh, from Malai's doubt, Günther Knabe. Would you agree? Would you say that the Hamid Karzai era will be remembered fondly? That's uh, depending on who you are belonging to, which group to which tribe in Afghanistan. Um, I'm rather skeptical about that very positive uh, resume you gave. He developed as a person and in his position. He was installed as a puppet of the Americans because they wanted to have somebody after the Taliban were driven off from uh, Afghanistan at least mostly. So they selected him. It was their choice. It was not the choice of the Afghans. He was installed after Bonn conference 
And in the beginning, he was probably seen by majority of the Afghans as, what I said before, a puppet of the Americans. But then he developed into somebody, as you said, who tried to, let's say, reunite the different factions and groups and ethnical groups in Afghanistan. And by that, he was rather successful, right? But on the other hand, uh, what he did not achieve was corruption is still in Afghanistan prevalent. Mm, and about the ethnical divisions in Afghanistan, he couldn't change very much. So I'm not that um, convinced that he was that great guy. While you touch upon many important points, ethnic divisions, corruptions, all we will come back in a little bit. But Sven Hansen, again, how will Hamid Karzai go down in history? What do you think? What's your take? I think he hasn't achieved that much, but on the other hand, he has achieved something which we first have to keep in mind. I mean, he survived. I think that's a very big, important thing. Uh, 10 years, 12 years ago, nobody would have uh, believed in that. That is one thing, so that is an achievement uh, by itself. And the other achievement we will now see with the elections, he allowed the first democratic transition uh, hopefully peaceful transition to a newly elected government. That is also something, especially in that region, that's something. So that might be his biggest uh, legacy. Uh, I think on other things, uh, or, or, um, he has not achieved that much. I mean, you mentioned already corruption and the drugs and also peace development. On the, I mean, there are many, many problems. Nevertheless, uh, he has somehow stabilized the whole on a, on a low level. But as I said, he survived, and now we can maybe move on. So that's something, I would say. And moving on is certainly something that the country needs desperately. Malai's doubt. Kunda Knab already pointed towards the fact that Hamid Karzai was a U.S. Um, candidate, or rather the U.S. pick. Uh, you shake your head uh, already. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm bothered by stuff like this. I'm, I would be very honest, and I would just put away my uh, kind of analytical hat here. Look, he comes from a very prominent family in the South. His father was, some 40, 50 years ago, the deputy speaker of the parliament. Now tell me how he is a puppet, you know. Secondly, he lived all his life in the region, either Afghanistan or Pakistan. Thirdly, in the Bonn conference, all the major political groups, from the Rome group to Cyprus to Peshawar group to the former Northern Alliance, they were all present. His name was put forward, and that name, was, that name gained the support of every single political entity. You cannot have everyone around the table. You have the major forces. If you look at all the peace building and, and the peace uh, projects, what you have is you have the main parties to the conflict. Of course, Taliban were excluded, only the top leadership. There are many Taliban who took part uh, in the, the uh, emergency law agenda, who took part on, in, in the constitutional law agenda. So this guy has a history of politics in Afghanistan. This is a misconception, a very common one, amongst especially the, the non-Afghans. In Afghanistan, we know who he is, who, we know where he came from, and how he made it to this, to this see, spot. Sorry, you said he lived all his life in the region, yes. but what about his years he spent in the United States? He didn't. This is a misconception. It's his brothers who lived in the U.S. He was in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Of course, he traveled broadly. He was, you, you have to look at some of the pictures, for example. He was part of the all negotiations between the Rome group and the former Northern Alliance. And he was the most probably one of the very few people from the no, Rome group, group side who was based in, in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Of course, his, his father was killed in the Quetta city in Pakistan. What was he doing there? And why was he killed by, by the Taliban? So Malai's doubt clearly <coughs> takes issue with your assessment that he is a U.S. puppet. Yeah. Um, but he was. He was. He was. He, he developed. I said he developed. <laughs> yeah, that was. I think we can agree that he, in the, at least in the first years, he was very much depending on the support by the U.S. I mean, he had no, no, uh, his own armed groups. He, he didn't have. He has no party. But who so was he it? has his tribe, and of course, he had uh, some backing. And I mean. There was who, who else you should have put hope on uh, in? He was the only one. So, I mean, the, the, the Western countries put a lot of hope in him and also, of course, the Afghan. I mean, it was a, a new start. So he was the one to do it. Uh, yeah, but who, who wasn't uh, dependent on the U.S. support? Even today, who isn't dependent on the U.S. support? I was listening to Dr. Ashraf Ghani's interview uh, yesterday with the CNN, and he said he would signed the bilateral security agreement because that guarantees the survival of, survival of our state still 12 years down the line. 
everyone, we were all dependent on the US support because we were facing this huge threat from the other side, which is the terrorists supported by the Pakistanis and the Arabs. So we were all dependent on it. If you look at the Muhammad Kaza as a political entity that leads a group, that leads a tribe, he was there, he was doing it before the US invasion, and he will continue doing it after the US troops leave, or all the troops leave. Well, regardless of how you perceive him, or perceived him, uh, rather, in the beginning, Guntak Naba, one thing is for certain, Sven Hansen has already mentioned it, he's the very first Afghan president to make way for a peaceful, or rather democratic transition. We will see how peaceful it will actually be uh, in, uh, in the end, <laughs> and how democratic, perhaps. But do you give him credit for that? Do you give uh, Hamid Karzai credit? for paving the way for, at least on paper, a democratic elect, uh, uh, transition? Yes, to some extent, yes. I would agree with you that he is uh, a very difficult seasoned Afghan politician and leader by, let's say, balancing the very different tribes and forces uh, in Afghanistan. He was very cleverly doing that, and he did that more and more uh, professionally. This is what I credit to him, no doubt. But then, without the, uh, let's say, Western support, no Afghan could have done that and achieved that. Yeah? This is something, yeah, yeah. what is not Karzai's, uh, let's say, achievement. It's simply the Western scheme. I'm back to that. But what he did, indeed, was, as I said before, it's, Afghanistan was a war-torn country. And it's now rather, rather pacified for the time being. Let's wait what, happened af what will happen after the elections. I'm very, very about that too. But for the time being, yes, that was his achievement. In that sense, I would compare him to the former king of Afghanistan. He was also not a politician. He didn't like, that was not his uh, role model what, to be king. Uh, he was somebody who was much more interested in archaeology and all the other beauties of, on earth. But what he did and did achieve, he did not very much, but whenever the leftists, or left meaning uh, politicians or streamings in Afghanistan came up too much, he calmed them down. The rights came up, he calmed them down. So he balanced the former king, like Karzai did it, the different uh, forces in Afghanistan quite cleverly and With smoothly. With one major difference, that Karzai has put in place way more democratic practices. If he could, if he wanted, he could reverse a lot of those those uh, uh, progresses that we've made. But he hasn't. This is the choice he has made. You know, I mean, he's taken head on the U.S. especially after 2009, and he's extremely powerful right now. Not only because of the the disproportionately central uh, political system that we have, highly centralized political system, but also because of the, the kind of support he gets from the people. The U.S. itself, one of its institutions, the Asia Foundation, says that 85% of Afghans support Karzai, still 12 years down the line. I don't think any head of state 12 years down the line anywhere in the world will have that record. Well, despite the high approval ratings that Hamid Karzai is enjoying these days, he will step down, that's for certain. What is not for certain is who will follow him. Many candidates have lined up to succeed him, but there are three in particular who have the greatest chances of taking over the presidency. Let's have a look at these candidates. The three presidential candidates with the best chance of winning the election are all established politicians. Abdullah Abdullah was foreign minister under President Karzai. He did well against his former boss in the 2009 presidential election, but dropped out of the runoff vote, citing election fraud. If he wins, Abdullah is promising to sign an agreement with the United States that would keep American troops in the country beyond 2014. Ashraf Ghani is also backing the security deal, which President Karzai has refused to endorse. Ghani is a former finance minister who has worked with the World Bank and the United Nations, but he has been criticized for picking former warlord Abdul Rashid Dostum as his running mate. Zalmay Rasul, another former foreign minister, has been one of Karzai's closest confidants. His critics say that he's too close to the corrupt administration that has run Afghanistan over recent years. 
Well, Sven Hansen, we just saw the three candidates, uh, one of them at least most likely to become the next Afghan president. Now, is this really a fresh start? We've seen and heard these individuals have been in government before. They are highly established political figures uh, in the country. All faces, really, is the old guard. Is, is a fresh start possible with these individuals? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. I mean, they are um, seasoned politicians, but uh, the, the difference f uh, in regard to the last elections is we have no clear favorite. So we really have a, a, a more open debate and uh, a more uh, severe competition. Um, also, the, uh, the whole system matured to a certain extent. So now you saw in the picture we had uh, TV debates, um, the campaign rallies uh, draw big crowds, and also the media ask more critical questions. So the people more want to know what are you going to do if you are elected. I mean, the answers uh, you can <laughs> really debate on whether they are so satisfactory, but I think the, the overall level uh, has, has risen. And uh, also the uh, candidates matured in that sense that they uh, tried to choose uh, their vice uh, candidates from different ethnic groups, so they be to be try to be more inclusive. So that I think is a, is a progress. So, um, and I would say all three are uh, how to say are uh, potential presidents. Let's say the West or, or the, the international community can work with. So that I would agree. And of course, Malai Zaw, uh, ethnic background matters in, in Afghanistan. Uh, we know that Ashraf Ghani and Zalmay Rasul are representing the Pashtun um, fraction, whereas Abdullah Abdullah uh, is half Pashtun, half Tajik, but is more or less associated with the Tajik fraction. Do you think these factors will uh, be decisive in the outcome? Um, yes. Of course, ethnicity is still unfortunately a factor. Um, however, this has been played uh, down by some people, but some other people have tried to elevate it to an extent to uh, benefit from it. Um, uh, well, Abdullah Abdullah technically is also Pashtun because his father is Pashtun. Uh, but because of his long association with the uh, former Northern Alliance, he's considered more pro uh, pro um, Tajiks. Um, uh, the ethnic uh, uh, composition of the tickets itself was not only because these people belong to different, different ethnic groups, but also because of the kind of votes they were going to bring to the tickets, apart from the ticket of the Zalmay Rasul. If you look at the Ashafghani's ticket, you've got uh, the former warlord uh, Dostum, because I mean, seriously, this guy will get like 90% of the Uzbek votes, at least, at least. Uh, and if you look at the Abdullah Abdullah's ticket, you've got uh, Muhammad Khan, who's a Pashtun. I don't think they have any major voter banks. And then you have Muhaqiq, who's a Hazara, and he's go going to bring a lot of Hazara votes. In the past, he has proven that he will, will get a lot of votes. Zalmay Rasul's ticket is a very different ticket, because he's supported mainly by Karzai. So he's just put people from other ethnicities in this ticket. But the support will come from Karzai's network. Yeah, but he's the only one having a woman, and that is yeah. also something. I mean, that's a, a kind of progress, I would say. And Gundak Nava, Malai's doubt has just mentioned Hamid Karzai has thrown his backing behind uh, Rasul. Uh, many people even say this is his backdoor, really, back through to influencing things in Afghanistan. After all, Hamid Karzai is only 56 years old, relatively young for a former president. And he's decided, he's made it clear, he's going to stay in the country. He, he built in, a villa. In, in the palace. Uh, he built the villa relatively close. So um, do you also think that theory is correct, that once Russell becomes president, really Karzai is going to stay on as a shadow president? Yes, I have my doubts whether these candidates, I agree that they are seasoned politicians, will have the power and the uh, proper maneuver to elope from the shadow of Karzai. This is the other side of it. Look, here's the prevalent political force and father of the nation, something like that, put all the other things aside. So it will be difficult for them. You were asking, is that a fresh start? I have my doubts, it's not a real fresh start. It's simply at best, it's a continuation of a process what might be good. And this is particular with regard to Ashraf Ghani. So it will be difficult for them, again, to elope from the shadow, the overweight of Karzai, and Karzai does know that. And he's trying to save his, uh, let's say, uh, picture in history, the future picture of him, by installing or proposing or supporting these candidates, whether it's him or him. Even 
Abdullah Abdullah, if he would be elected president, he could not await that heavy influence. And imagine a former president would stay on the premises <laughs> of the presidency in Germany or in any other country. So this is a symbol, a big, big symbol. Yeah. It's not the premises. Again, another <laughs> misconception. We had this tradition of having different palaces. It's one of those palaces that is being renovated for President Kazai. But so he's staying close. He's staying with It's not the only place. his decision. It's the decision of all the Afghan elites, you know. Mm. There were many consultations and people knew that he, wo he deserved it. Anyhow, secondly, no. Not all the candidates are going to be burdened by the influence of what Hamid Karzai did and his proximity to the palace. Number one, Abdullah Abdullah still has a lot of resentment against Karzai, especially because of the 2009 election. Secondly, they say the ticket of Abdullah, very close people to Abdullah and his uh, vice presidential candidates, that Karzai did everything to jeopardize their ticket. But he couldn't, because all the other tickets, there are, the architecture of all other tickets was Karzai. This is another fact. Uh, fact thirdly, I mean, sorry? A fact or saying, that's the question. No, it's a fact. Uh. I, it's a fact. I've done my research. I've mm -hmm. uh, put it in my papers recently. If you look at it, I've spoken to, to the very close days of all these people. Like those who went to Karzai and said, what should I do, you know, in the election? He said, go and become the deputy of Ashraf Ghani. Ashraf Ghani came to him, said, okay, I want to run. He said, okay, I'm here to support you, so run. And then uh, he asked his vice, second vice president to provide a second deputy to, to, to Ashraf Ghani. So they are all puppets to Karzai, except for... Definitely, because they knew that it, they are not now. They knew that without his support, they would not be able to win. So they all went to him and he told almost everyone, okay, you're my candidate, you're my candidate, apart from Abdullah Abdullah. And you know what else he did? Other people, when they went to him and said, whom should we support, he distributed them very carefully. You know, this former governor to this guy, you go to this guy. You... So that's what he's done. Anyhow, Ashraf Ghani initially thought he was the uh, favorite candidate of Karzai. But now it turns out it's Zalmay Rasul and Ashraf Ghani's campaign is resenting and they are very, very angry at what is going on. So if Ashraf Ghani comes to power, and because I worked very closely with Ashraf Ghani, I think he will not be a happy man with Karzai. Sven Hansen, yes. uh, the two brothers, Hamid Karzai's older brothers, also at some point threw their head in the ring and took it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's why we all think that uh, Rasul is the candidate of Karzai, because his uh, brothers endorsed Rasul. I mean, officially, Karzai has uh, not endorsed anybody, and I think that is also smart not to do it. And I think he plays a kind of divide and rule tactics. But of course, that gives uh, his brothers, that gives a hind that probably Karzai is uh, behind Rasul. So in yes. some shape or form, Hamid Karzai seems to still uh, will hold a grip, perhaps, on Afghan affairs. Yeah, I mean, his grip will be the stronger, the weaker the future president will be. I mean, if, he has, if there would be a president elected with a very strong mandate, very powerful, then uh, that person can uh, be relatively free of the influence of Karzai. But if it's a weak president winning with a, war, a small margin, he might have to need, he, he might need uh, Karzai's uh, support to, to really make it. And so. another, another challenge, aside from who's going to win, is in 2009, we know that at least one million votes were disqualified. Mm -hmm. uh, how likely do you think election fraud is going to be this time around? I think the, uh, the chance is very high that there will be election fraud. Uh, what is still open, whether in general the elections will be regarded as credible. I mean, the, the um, technical challenge and the logistic challenge, the security challenge, I mean, that's uh, enormous. So there will be problems, there will be fraud, there will be even between uh, 5 and 10 percent of the polling stations not being able to open that day because it's too dangerous. So you will find many, many re uh, reasons why you can always argue, ah, this is not fair. So the, the, it will be a relative, uh, a relatively uh, fair or not fair. So that's a big question. And um, yeah, I mean, the, there are changes, or let's say the, the situation is a bit different than last time. So la uh, now you have three candidates relatively close together. They have organized their camp, so they, they watch each other quite closely. Also, the uh, media are uh, having a closer look. Also, the voters are somehow more better educated. Or and So I think... Technology. Yeah, the technology, uh, the, you know, you have a barcode on, 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 on this, this system. Um, but on the other hand, if, if uh, you have more awareness, people will also see more. 
uh, rigging. So that's uh, the, 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 um, the uh, contraproductive effect that uh, when people are not caring that much, you know, they won't see it. Now you will probably see it everywhere. So um, yeah, I think that the big, that's a big question. Will these uh, elections be credible? And I think the credibility of the election is much more important than who will finally win. And uh, one thing we, we know, Günther Knabe, we don't know if these elections are going to be free and fair. The question is, how safe will they be? Uh, because the Taliban has already vowed that they will do everything within their power to disrupt these elections. They say anyone who goes to the polls on Saturday could risk their life. And already we've seen, unfortunately, a string of attacks which have led to casualties. Um, do you think that will deter a great number of Afghan individuals to go and cast their vote? This is difficult to say, but of course the Taliban are threatening because they won't accept any kind of election and nobody who is elected by more or less democratic and uh, free elections. So they try their best to disturb the uh, election process. But to me it's surprising that they did not more up to now to interfere. We have to wait to, until election day, but I think the threat which was spoken out and uh, proposed by the Taliban is not that big up to now as one had to expect. Okay. This is amazing to me or surprising or it's a good sign. Why do you think that is? Because they're not as strong anymore or because they're restraining themselves? Difficult to say. Um, maybe. They're not strong and, mm. and the, the, the Afghan security forces are much stronger now. The Taliban are losing finances. Uh, the Saudi uh, sheikhs are now uh, diverting their resources to the Syrian conflict. Uh, the uh, Afghan uh, businessmen who are based in Pakistan, Samuel Yusuf, a Pakistani seasoned journalist, has done a brilliant piece on this. They, because of the Taliban brutality, their sheer uh, criminality, they are now not, not willing to pay for Taliban anymore. Pakistan is uh, at its feet because of, economically Pakistan is not a viable state anymore. Just recently, Saudi Arabia gave it $1.5 billion. So Taliban simply don't have the resources. Second thing is the Afghan security forces are much stronger now. I see a different aspect of it. The Taliban are still, I think, uh, preparing for the time after the election. And any mm, maneuver or any killing of Afghan people during this election process would black blacken their face much more than before. So they might also think we avoid to do that so that after the election we are still accepted by Afghan people when we start some kind of talks, political talks, with the then president and government about any kind of uh, participating in the government, coalition or whatever. So that might be also a very clever political movement. Yeah, by Sven, the Taliban. Sven Hansen, uh, how strong are the Taliban? Do you think they will uh, regain the same stature uh, that they had prior to the US invasion in 2001? I mean, that's depending on, on uh, a lot of uh, different factors. And I th think one factor will be how credible will the elections be, how uh, legitimate will be seen the, the new president. Uh, but I also would argue that the Taliban, they have an image problem or they have to care about their image. They recently, when they attacked the Serena Hotel, they at point blank uh, shot two small kids. I mean, uh, th that's very bad for their image, I would say. I mean, they, that was not people killed in crossfire, but it was a cold-blooded murder of, of children. I mean, it's really crazy. So, and that. I mean, I think if they, it's not a question of resources, of financial resources, whether you are able to, to blow up a, a campaign meeting of 10,000 people. I think they would have the capabilities to do it. But it would... Uh, it, 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 yeah, but I mean, so they, they, I mean, have, they have suicide uh, uh, bombers. Uh, I think they, they don't have a lack of that. So, but uh, the question is, would it be a smart move from, from their side? And I, say, I would say it's not smart. I don't so know. I don't therefore, know. probably they have not done it. What you're, but they what's would so have the cap they would have the, have the capabilities. Yeah. I don't know what source your argument is based on. There's a recent paper by the Afghan Analyst Network in which the author says that from the seven districts of Ghazni where Taliban had most of its foot soldiers in, in this province and surrounding provinces, in the past one year they got only three people now fight, to, willing to fight for them. So that's also winning. It's also human resources, financial resources, weapons and everything else. 
Of course, the sheer brutality also plays a big role. And yeah. the Serena attack was not the first one. For the past five years, they've become, become more brutal uh, against civilians because simply they cannot target the ta targets they want to target. There are videos of Taliban playing football with the heads of, of uh, people they've killed. And that takes a toll. The Afghan people now overwhelmingly reject their way of governance. And to the question of whether Taliban are uh, playing a waiting game, they are not. They know that the best bet for them is Karzai because he is conceding so much to them. After Karzai, it's an unknown th territory they would, they would not like to, to tread. When it comes to the fraudulent elections, look, the problem again is not 2009. The problem started in 2004 with the first presidential election. The fraud was done especially by the international community. The U.S. knowingly uh, did a lot of fraud to make sure that Karzai is elected. You know, so it started there, moving on to 2005, there were more fraud, and then 2009, it came to blows because President Karzai simply wouldn't accept the, what Robert Gates puts as the failed putsch of the international community against him. That's why it came to the, to the fore. Even the media, the Western media, turned a blind eye to the sheer corruption that was done in 2004 and 2005. It's because these elections, the former elections and this, these elections, will be presented to the West as, look, we went to Afghanistan yeah. to uh, export or missionary, I call it the democracy missionary yeah. action. So they want to prove, look, there was democracy brought by us to Afghanistan and the election should be the proof to the public in our countries. That's why these elections are important because they are, these are Afghanized. No, these elections are important because they are a face-saving measure for the West to leave the country. So the West needs these elections. But Whether there's a fraud or not, the West is not uh, inclined to, to criticize the fraud. I mean, the, the motivation of the West is we want to leave, and therefore we want to show that it's not that bad what we have done there. So therefore we need uh, yeah, elections who somehow more or less worked. Mm. So even if there is uh, the same level of fraud, the criticism would be less because yeah. we want to leave. We, that's, Glossed that's, over. Yeah, yeah glossed over. over. Well, that's, that's a face saving uh, event. Because, the, you know, only one candidate, Abdullah Abdullah, is deploying 30,000 observers. Uh, the Free and Fair Election uh, uh, Foundation of Afghanistan is deploying 10,000 uh, observers. And as I said, technology. There are people, 18 million people with mobile phones. So even if the US doesn't want it, our media is proactive and you are going to see everything that is going to happen. But of course, Sven Hansen, you are right because uh, 2014 is a very decisive year for Afghanistan, not because of the elections, but also, as you've alluded to, the ISAF troops are leaving, the ISAF mission is coming to an end at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, if, if you think about how it all started with more than 40 nations and 140,000 troops, a uh, big mission uh, back post. Yeah, it started very small. Uh, it started, it started with, small. It, it remember blossomed it started broader. with 6,000 and even uh, uh, like uh, Mr. Vendrell, the, the former uh, UN, uh, um, how to say, the, the special, <coughs> special envoy, and then later the deputy special envoy, he said 6,000 not enough, we need at least 30,000. And in those days, everybody said, ah, nobody would give you 30,000 soldiers. So, uh, but in the, end, in the beginning, it only started 6,000 in, in Kabul. And Real said, now we need some for Herat, for Mazar, for Kandahar. So for the big cities, we need uh, 30,000. And then it, uh, it took years until it was uh, Soldiers lifted. are always asking for more soldiers if they don't fit exactly. <laughs> yeah, but he was and not don't a forget, soldier. The start of the yeah, military yeah. action was yeah. actually to get Osama bin Laden. This was fighting against yeah. the yeah. terrorism yeah. of Al Qaeda. But that then developed into a war in Afghanistan, yeah. and partly against Afghanistan. Well, yeah. it started small, but it yeah. certainly blossomed into yeah, yeah. one of the bigger the, international the operations in recent. Uh, uh, unprecedented in the history. Yeah, yeah. Of and, and the question that I would have now that yeah. supposedly the troops are, are leaving Afghanistan, uh, how do the average Afghans uh, perceive uh, this uh, coming withdrawal? I, is, it, is it joy? Is it the fact that finally we get to take matters into our own hands? Or is, is uh, perhaps uh, fear also a factor here? Yeah, fear is a factor. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, the, when the troops came, they were relatively welcomed, warmly welcomed, most of them. And uh, they are not that warmly received anymore because they, they made a lot of mistakes. And uh, yeah, but the, there's now a lot of uncertainty. And um, 
uh, I mean, the, the Afghan troops have uh, learned a lot, but uh, still there's a question whether they could uh, do it alone. So the, the kind of compromise is now they need more training. And what I see the biggest problem is they not only need training, but they need money. I mean, uh, their salary has to be paid, and that's a big risk and also maybe the big mistake. Uh, in the end, the West did. You, you created a, a huge uh, armed forces. And if they run out of control, you create the next civil war or the next big problem. So you have to pay them, but even if you pay them, you are not uh, cannot be sure about their loyalty. <laughs> and if you are not paying them, uh, that's uh, creating trouble. So uh, yeah, I think that's a big risk. And that's also where the Afghans are. Maybe at the moment they see, okay, our forces are better maybe than or more um, <clears throat> more sensible to our our sentiments than, than American forces or German forces. But uh, we don't know when they are not being paid, they, they become uh, criminals, armed criminals, armed so, groups. So mixed so. emotions then uh, about yeah. the withdrawal uh, of ISF troops malized out. Still the, the question is, has security in life of, for the av average Afghan really improved? Uh, during these uh, past decade, really, of, of uh, foreign troops' presence? It's really difficult to say, to be honest. It's a huge country. Every area has different dynamics. So you have to look at the country and analyze every part of the country in a different way. Here's the thing, you know. Um, uh, we, the, the, the urban areas have improved drastically, you know. Again, for example, in my province of Paktika, we didn't have a single meter of paved road, you know. And now we have paved roads, roads all over, you know. Schools are open, clinics are open, and of course people have the opportunity to participate in the, in the decision-making process of the country. Though it's still in a very elitist country in a sense, because elites have everything and the common people suffer. But, but seeing how the lives are affected, that's why some of the studies are informed by, by the, uh, by, by the uh, impact that this intervention has left. 70 plus pe person, people of Afghanistan ha still approve of the intervention, even the uh, presence of the American troops. Whereas in Pakistan, 90% people think the US is the biggest enemy. In Egypt, 90% pe people think the US is the biggest enemy. So you had a, a military presence, still more than 70% people. That's not only because of the kind of, of, uh, of what, what the international forces did, but also because we have so many other predatory forces in the region that we prefer the Western international forces rather than the, the region. So I would say it's been positive, generally speaking. Of course, there have been lots of problems too. And Gunter Knabe, since Malai's doubt mentioned Pakistan, it's an important factor. It has been an important factor in Afghanistan, but so, so have been uh, Iran uh, uh, and even India to a certain degree. Now, how do you think these, these uh, nations, surrounding and neighboring nations, will position themselves after the election? They are all observing Afghanistan since years very keenly, and first starting with Pakistan. Pakistan and Afghanistan, I consider as being Siamese twi twins. You can't divide them without bloodshed. The, the borderline is not a border, it's simply Pashtun area settlements. Mm -hmm. And the enmity between the Afghans and the Pakistani in general is deeply since historical, for historical reasons. Afghans still don't accept or recognize the Durand line which was drawn as a friendship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is deep in the minds of the Afghans. And on the other hand, Pakistan still considers, at least parts of Pakistan, consider Afghanistan as something like it should be a protectorate of Pakistan. Uh, sorry, of Pakistan, yes, right. So this is a deep ingrained enmity. And on the other hand, Pakistan still is trying to have more influence upon Afghanistan, which is a problem for the Americans too, on the other hand. It's still the region of retreat for the uh, uh, terrorists and uh, Islamistic uh, terrorists, then the f enemy of Pakistan is India and the enemy of my enemy is my friend, therefore Afghans like, for one reason, like India quite much. It's the most popular country, according to polls, recent polls, in Afghanistan. Of course, India also wants to counterbalance Pakistan with influence in Afghanistan. 
Iran has got a vested interest in Afghanistan due to the Shia groups in Afghanistan, mainly the uh, Hazara minority, and to the north, they are very much afraid Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, of developments in Afghanistan. There comes in one thing we didn't mention yet, the drug production and export of drugs towards the north, the west, the west, the east. This is something which are, they are very much concerned about. Terrorists from Afghanistan maybe again, and mainly drugs. And since we're running out of time slowly, let me get your quick assessment, Sven Hansen. What do you think will happen? What's the most likely outcome of the presidential election? That we will have a second round and that probably the, the loser, I mean the third guy, uh, he will cry foul. And then the question is how credible can he cry foul? <clears throat> Malais? Two scenarios. We'll either have um, one of the three major candidates elected in the second round. Uh, and uh, the second scenario is there could be a lot of fraud. There would be fraud, of course. And then uh, there would be all the, the cries and the crisis. And this will actually benefit President Karzai to stay on for another year because it will go on for such a very long time. Good tech, Naba. Well, and whoever will lose the elections, he will claim for the reasons Sven Hansen mentioned there was fraud and there were no elections at all in many provinces and districts. So they will claim, or the loser will claim, losers will claim these elections are not valid. Well, valid or not, we will have an election coming up, a very decisive election for the future of Afghanistan. And of course, we will continue to follow this story uh, very closely, along with my experts, whom I want to thank for a, a very lively and engaging discussion. Uh, thank you out there, of course, for tuning in. And looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga. <laughs>